with more than 35 countries, 4.3 billion people and 1.9 trillion in trade, the Indo-Pacific is perhaps the most important geostrategic region. The United States has always considered itself as an Indo-Pacific nation, that the region is home to the world's two most populous countries, and neighbors to boot, namely India and China, makes it even more important for Washington. In a document titled A Free and Open Indo-Pacific, Advancing a Shared Vision, dated November 4, 2019, the U.S. State Department said this, Today, Indo-Pacific nations face unprecedented challenges to their sovereignty, prosperity and peace. The U.S. National Security Strategy released in December 2017 recognizes that the most consequential challenge to U.S. and partner interests is the growing competition between free and repressive visions of the future international order. Authoritarian revisionist powers seek to advance their parochial interests at others' expense." Unquote. Seen against that backdrop, China's recent aggressive moves globally, be it against India along the Ladakh border, or escalation in standoffs against Malaysia and Vietnam in the South China Sea, menacing of Taiwan with nighttime drills in the Taiwan Strait, or multi-layer pressure against Australia have all made countries around the world rather anxious. However, it is India, America, Japan and Australia, known as the quadrilateral or simply quad, which have joined hands to not only protect the Indo-Pacific, but generally head off Beijing's aggression globally. As part of that, India is hosting joint naval exercises next month, known as Malabar 2020 in the Bay of Bengal. What is added, a particular sharpness to Malabar 2020, is that New Delhi has just invited Australia to join the exercises after 13 years. Malabar 2020 has China quite worried, prompting it to describe them as the rise of the Indo-Pacific, NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Bharat FM spoke to Manish Chand, a well-known New Delhi-based foreign affairs analyst, journalist and editor-in-chief of India Rights Network. Manish is founder-CEO of TGII Media Private Limited, a leading media publishing and research company, as well as editor-in-chief of India and the World, an influential magazine and journal focused on international affairs. Here is Manish Chand. Okay, welcome to Bharat FM. Manish, it's a great pleasure to have you on at a time when there's seems to be a dramatic uh, development in uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue with Australia joining in. T tell us a bit about what do you think happened suddenly after 13 years, Australia felt okay, and India felt okay that it should be joining the exercise. Yeah. Uh, right, Mank. Uh, thanks for inviting me to your program. And as you say, this is a very exciting moment in geopolitics. Uh, you see, I mean, uh, the, the, the participation of uh, Australia in the Quad, uh, in the Malabar, uh, has, been a long, has been long overdue. It's been building up uh, for more, more than a decade since last time it participated. So it's been a work in progress. And uh, you know, as I say, this was caught in thousand visions and revisions, to use a line from T.S. Eliot, you know, uh, and a bit of Hamletian right. uh, dilemma, whether to join Malabar or not, to join Quad <laughs> or not. You know, so there were a lot of deference, uh, vacillations, and this goes back to primarily, you know, some sort of deference to uh, Chinese sensitivities. Uh, any uh, people who are familiar with the, the brief history, you know, more than a decade, would know that how uh, the then Australian Prime Minister uh, suddenly developed Kevin Rudd, developed cold feet, and uh, that's how Quad 1.0 collapsed, sort of, for that, for that moment. It was finally revived in uh, 2017 uh, with a meeting of senior officials uh, in Manila. Now, the immediate context of the revival was also from India's point of view. This happened only a few months after the Doklam crisis, uh, the India-China standoff. So that is a very significant point. Of course, uh, the, the geopolitical development, China's increasing assertiveness, uh, uh, and the change landscape where uh, there was a growing perception that, you know, the leading democracies of the region 
need to get together uh, to constrain China. You know, I'm using that expression very carefully because uh, it's become a bit of a buzzword, you know, a cliche, uh, China containment. Uh, to me, it, it's more appropriate to use constraint, you know, because it's not a gang up as it is portrayed uh, to be by some. Mm -hmm. So coming back to now the situation, why this invitation on October 19? Mm -hmm. And uh, the context again is that, right. uh, you know, for the last few months, uh, all the four quad countries have been at the receiving end of Chinese assertiveness, some say coercion, intimidation, or call you whatever you want. That there was a growing uh, sense of exasperation, wariness uh, against uh, Chinese abrasiveness, uh, if one can put it like that. And uh, in this, at this particular the timing for India, because India is inviting Australia and it is hosting the Malabar. Well, obviously that for the five months, uh, last five months, India and China have been engaged in, uh, you know, these uh, so-called uh, negotiations and uh, backroom uh, maneuvers and whatever to, to resolve this crisis, which is the uh, most serious crisis to afflict India-China relations uh, with, uh, if not control, uh, could lead to devastating consequences, you know, for both countries as well as the region. So I think the finally... Uh, there was a, the call was taken and I think the call was taken immediately after or even at the Tokyo ministerial meeting, which happened on October 6. That is uh, when the four foreign ministers, foreign ministers of the four countries uh, met in person in Tokyo. This was the first standalone ministerial meeting, mind you. And the fact that in the middle of the pandemic, right. these four foreign ministers will travel in person to Tokyo underscored the urgency of getting their act together and finally deliver this message to, to China and to the world that look, we, that the, the four democracies are going to stand together and they are ready to stand up and be counted finally. That the, the hesitation, the sense of reticence that marked earlier versions of meetings and the court was over. It's like, I think a strategic call was taken to go upfront with it. Of course, there are subtle differences in the postures of and the positions of each of these four countries. For example, at the Tokyo meeting, uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Mike uh, Pompeo was quite upfront. He really lashed out at you know what he called coercion, intimidation of Communist Party of China. He was uh, you know it was a diatribe of sorts. Compared to that. Uh, right. Our foreign minister, India's foreign minister, Jai Shankar, was a very restrained speech. Uh, and he spoke mostly in general terms about uh, shaping a free and open uh, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific, uh, which is what brings in the larger ideological sense all the four countries together in this formation. And going forward, the participation of Australia uh, in the Quad, uh, in the Malabar, is the culmination of these related geopolitical developments. Also, it follows uh, the virtual summit between Prime Minister Modi and Scott Morrison, Australian Prime Minister, a uh, few uh, months ago, uh, which culminated in a very important decision to sign mutual logistics support agreement. Once you sign mutual logistics support agreement, and now we have, India has mutual uh, logistics support agreement with all the three countries. So participation of Australia in the Malabar 2020 edition is therefore a very logical progression of things happening for quite some time, you know, geopolitical events. Right. A couple of yeah. points jumped out at me in the immediate. One is, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, not that there was any immediate emergency see for the four to meet personally in, in the time of this pandemic. What do you think triggered that personal meeting in uh, Tokyo number six, that's number one. I'll come to the next question once you tell me what you think about mm -hmm. that. So, uh, as I was telling you that, uh, uh, you know, the point is that, you know, as we know that there is a moment where we say enough is enough. You know, that we got to be doing something rather than talking. And uh, I think uh, apart from the fact that uh, the imperative of taking on China, because each of them were hit. U.S. has been engaged in a long, bruising trade war. Australia-China uh, relations are at the worst ever. 
you know, with the, uh, you know, lots of uh, punitive actions by Chinese, you know, uh, against uh, Australian in, in the trade economic arena. And India was having this, uh, you know, border crisis with China. So each of them were, uh, I mean, if you look at it from one perspective, uh, were in some way seen to be or felt that they are victims of uh, this kind of, uh, you know, intimidation, uh, this kind of assertiveness uh, and, uh, and the need for four of them to get together. You know, the point is that uh, the idea of traveling in person was this, that it was actually a pragmatic step which is that the last time they met, which was on the sidelines of the UNGA in New York, uh, September, we, I was also there at, at covering that summit, you know. Uh, this, this was the first meeting of, at the foreign minister leave, but that happened on the margins of the UN, a multilateral summit. So it is almost now, it was a little over a year. It was high time that they met and with the pandemic uh, showing no sign of easing and the pandemic situation becoming very fraught, volatile, unpredictable, which means if they don't meet now, uh, then uh, it could take months. So why not now when there is a, there is, there are some urgent issues on the table? Also, you had a change of guard in Tokyo. So this was a first meeting uh, after the installation of, uh, of a new government, a new prime minister in Japan. So this was also Japan on Japan part. It was a signal of continuity in Abe's uh, Prime Minister Suga wanted to signal uh, the continuity right. in Japan's commitment to Indo-Pacific and the Quad. So I think there, there was a convergence of... Uh, uh, my... Yeah. Also, no, my, go if I can add, yeah. uh, add one more point, you know, which is this, that uh, since the eruption of the pandemic, there has been a surfeit of these virtual summits and dialogues. Uh, you know, virtual, uh, it's a good way to be in touch, these virtual interactions. Uh, but, uh, you know, it lacks that immediacy of physical interaction. You know, come to think of it in some ways, right. the virtual uh, interactions are in some way on the record, they're online. And the safety and uh, security of that communication cannot be entirely guaranteed. And where something like Quad, which is evolving, right. uh, where there is no fixed agenda, really, come to think of it, it's all a work in progress. It makes sense for uh, the protagonist, the lead interlocutors, uh, to get together across the table and discuss these things, you know. Yeah. True. Uh, another point that stands out for me personally is given the way China th thinks of itself in historical terms. Wouldn't it have mm -hmm. fed its ego that it's taking four major powers to take on us? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite get that. It will feed Chinese ego, is it? That it takes four powers to get it? Yeah, <laughs> Is that what you're asking? They, they can turn around and say, it's your four and I'm against one. Come on, let's, let's yeah, uh, get real about know, this. I, I, I mean, that's, uh, that's like, if you want to pump up your ego like that, uh, then okay. But you know, the point is, uh, the real reality is that China uh, is quite anxious. Uh, the China, this getting together of these four democracies, you know, is the same thing where they launched, the, uh, you know, in 2007, when they submitted a demarche to all the, that, you know, you guys are ganging up against China, the rise of China and Chinese containment won't work. And now, in fact, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said that, uh, you know, you were creating an Indo-Pacific NATO. So I think what China is extremely, right. yeah, resentful of is this, uh, uh, I, I mean, you know, come to think of it is there is a bit of irony here, which is this, that uh, all these uh, four countries uh, feel uh, themselves as a grief party. That is at the receiving end of Chinese tactics. But with this, this kind of alignment, China is also trying to portray itself. Look, these guys are gang, it's a persecution complex of sorts, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, they, so, you know, the, the point is that uh, one has to find the finer points here, which is that somehow or other, this debate about, uh, the discourse about the Quad, the Indo-Pacific and uh, Malabar now is getting conflated with uh, some sort of China containment, which has become the big buzzword, you know, and the cliche, it has got completely boxed in here. 
And the idea of four countries uh, getting together and taking on China, it may sound fancy also. Because come to think of it, uh, you know, America is uh, what, $18 trillion economy? China is 14 trillion. And if all the quad gets together and militarization, why do you need to even have a quad if you really want to do that? Uh, right. Now, Trump is talking about uh, G7, a new G, G11, sorry, G10, J11. So, you know, what is happening is that uh, China, some of the China has become a, a symbol of a, a rule defying uh, rising hegemon, you know, a disruptive power. And that right. has uh, triggered a coalition building across the spectrum. Quad is just one part of it. Trump was more ambitious. He was trying to get in other countries. Then there is a quad plus. So it is not just a gang up of the four. It, could, it is potentially more, you know, a kind of a full G20. Uh, not the, the G20 as it exists today, but a, 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 a larger coalition of China, constrainers or containers or whatever you like to call it. So there's nothing to feel pumped up about. Right. It is, in fact, uh, signal China's isolation. You know, because these are also big trading partners of China. All of them. That's a problematic part of the quad. Because right. each of them are so int intimately intertwined in the economic arena that uh, decoupling is very unrealistic. An all-out alliance, so to speak. Right. In in the short term, what do you think Madhabar 2020 aimed at achieving? See, in the short term, uh, what it means is that uh, with all that is going on, uh, especially the, the deepening stalemate in India-China, for example, it is a strategic signaling to China that, look, if you are not going to uh, follow up on your promises and commitments, and, and restore status quo ante and restore this, then it will compel India for one to go deeper into quad, to deepen this network. This is a very important messaging because so far, India has been uh, very cautious and circumspect and all out of uh, deference or, being sens or showing some sensitivity to Chinese concerns is important to bear in that mind like for example even in the case of pandemic india was among the major country which did not name we did not talk about chinese virus or did not play up on the origin of the virus that is why uh, to a lot of indians this right. has come as a major shocker you know especially after the bonhomie of the two informal summits by the way it was only last october that both the prime minister uh, prime minister modi and xi jinping were putting their hands together uh, against the backdrop of exquisite uh, Mahabalipuram sculptures. And now all that consensus has right. fallen apart. Uh, so there is that immediate context. What is it trying to achieve? That is the immediate context that each of them, for example, with Australia also, it's at the breaking point, the relationship. So essentially, it's a signal by all the four countries that China has to be more accommodating of other partners' concerns, you know. And uh, failing which, uh, you know, this is going to get uh, really worse. That's one part. The second part is a pragmatic part, you know, that the quad, uh, the four uh, democracies, the four leading naval powers, you know, all of them have, uh, you know, fairly uh, uh, sizable navies, you know. Uh, all of them are naval powers in their own right. And, and having done their mutual logistics pact, uh, it is but a logical thing for four of them to enhance this, uh, you know, uh, to, to do these war games, enhance uh, naval coordination. Uh, and also, it's also rooted in some way, a quad is also trying to promote in some ways, India as a net security provider. And the common concerns like, right. uh, who is going to protect? You know, you're talking about free and open Indo-Pacific, but you need some agency to preserve that, to, 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 to sustain that rules-based order. To, to ensure that this is not thwarted and subverted at will uh, by an abrasive and ambitious power. It could be anyone right now. It is. It may be in some, right. some people living in China. Yeah. So that's a short term. Yeah. Right. In context of specific context of Sino-Australian dynamic, uh, I'm mm -hmm. again struck by the fact that uh, from barley to beef and from wine to journalists, 
everything has been on the table uh, as you write in your piece uh, for India Rights Network. Uh, it's interesting, people don't realize how diplomacy spills over into something as everyday as right. they be for barley or wine and even right, right. Uh, how, talk yeah, a uh -huh. bit about yeah, you, you see, Bayek, this is about uh, something which China has been doing for a long time, uh, weaponization of trade, uh, which, is, which is, you know, not many people know that, but China is the largest trading partner of 140 countries around the world, 140 countries. What it means is that it gives it tremendous economic leverage. It's like, you know, you like me or you don't like me, but, you know, I am the money man, you know, I'm the big guy. So. You know, it's, it's that mentality. And, you know, also, I think this is also, uh, uh, this whole thing of this China versus the rest is also emanating from uh, a kind of a construct which has been uh, diligently nurtured by the uh, Western uh, think tanks, Western media. In a way, by both sides, this propaganda war warfare that China as a evil one, China as a bad boy. This has been going on for quite some time. It, it, in some ways, it is reminiscent of the kind of propaganda war that was happening in the Soviet period, whereas everything to do with Soviet Union. So China is being constantly, China is in the uh, uh, news mostly getting headlines. Because Uyghurs are being uh, tortured, discriminated. Chinese narrative is something else on the Tibet. So it's also about competing narratives. So. My sense is that over the years, China has developed a siege mentality of sorts. And that's why, you know, they launched, they went on an offensive, whole four-year diplomacy. So, you know, going all out. So right. coming back right. to this, you know, not like talking about journalists, like this has been happening uh, so frequently with Americans. They've been doing, they've been throwing out American journalists. So essentially, it's the Communist Party of China. It has a certain worldview. Uh, CPC is saying that, you know, Western democracy, maybe Francis Fukuyama believed that the history ended in 1991 with the triumph of liberal uh, free market democracy. Uh, but CPC, and you look at China as a $14 trillion economy. It's not a joke, you know. It will remain a formidable power. It will remain the largest trading partner of all these four countries in the foreseeable future as well. You know, with, with India, it is U.S., but, you know, a substantial partner. So it has that leverage. So it's like, you know, you try to, uh, uh, you know, it's like you you do all these things which can be seen uh, construed on one way as a bullying of sorts, you know. Uh, uh, on the trade front, you hit somebody, you, you know, you put their journalist uh, in jail or detain them. It is a, a kind of a propaganda psychological warfare that is happening. And essentially the Chinese strategy has always right. been in some way to figure out who blinks first, you know. And if, like, for example, India has uh, uh, same. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, to to yeah. finish the Australian part of it, uh, uh, is it the right sense to have that it of the four, it is perhaps the weakest link given its own uh, problems of economy, which China, and India, the U.S. can absorb quite a bit, but Australia mm -hmm. could be a, a problematic thing. Do you think that may be an accurate way yes. to look at that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so because you know the there is a huge economic uh, dependence and interdependence. Uh, if the Chinese really pull out, if still an economy will be ravaged to a great extent, no doubt about it. Uh, and besides, there is also the weakest link also from the point of view of Quad. That's why it was not part of. It was not the insider in the Quad because what happened, uh, Kevin right. Rudd was symptomatic of this, uh, you know, uh, this ambivalence about China in Australia's establishment. Uh, you know, there are powerful China supporters. There are China haters also. And there are more the moderates, the centrist ones, vis-a-vis -vis China. So for Australia to calibrate its policy vis-a-vis -vis China is an exercise that is fraught with some real consequences. So, you know, it cannot afford to antagonize or alienate China beyond the point. And, and then there is an internal politics right. in Australia, where, where there are powerful uh, constituency, which feel that uh, Australia, uh, China's partnership with China is in Australia's interest, not only in economic, in larger interest. 
there is a large community of uh, Chinese in Australia now and, and otherwise, you know. So there, there, is a, there has been a great deal of intertwining. Uh, so for Australia, it is still possible that now that you have joined uh, Malabar, uh, you are in quad, of course, but there could be another cave in run. So in that sense, it is the weakest link, you know, that you, I you, see. you, yeah. Right. But having said that, I'll also call no, it. Right. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. No, what I'm saying is that the geopolitical, uh, you know, there are, uh, Australia is also, if you look at it, Australia has been quite assertive. It has scaled up its defense budget to uh, mind boggling $190 billion. So Australia is also signaling that, okay, we may be small and relatively and all that. It still, it's a G20 economy. It's in the, you know, powerful groupings. It has powerful partners and friends. And the Quad is a, an expression of that. So, so I think this time around Australia, there is a sense of national assertion vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. But as I said, you know, uh, China has also cultivated constituencies powerful uh, in Australia. So there is that element that tomorrow, like right now, what we are seeing, the China-Australia relations at an all-time low, that may change. And then Australia's attitude towards Quad and Malabar may become a little more nuanced or may even be reversed. Right. Yeah. Of the four, India would be what you call the frontline state, uh, given the, the, the fact that the two share a huge border. Uh, how different are India's stakes within the four compared to the other three? Yeah, you see, India is also in a, in a somewhat similar situation, but with that difference, that India is the only country which has the same, you know, a billion plus people, and large countries and neighbors. We have an unresolved uh, boundary uh, dispute with China, which will always be a problem. I mean, you know, for others, for uh, Mike Pompeo to to rubbish China like that, the way he did it at the Quad meeting in Tokyo, and all those uh, very uh, virulent statements that emanate from Washington, uh, it may they can afford to indulge in that. But with India, the stakes are uh, far bigger. You know, we have an unresolved dispute with a far superior neighbor. By superior neighbor, I mean that, you know, on every indices, on every, uh, if you look at it, militarily, it is more powerful China any day. Its economy is uh, four to five times bigger. Uh, in every arena, uh, except for probably soft power, uh, China is, uh, right. Miles said, is comprehensive national power. So that makes it, you know, that explains that why India was also uh, quite circumspect and was hedging its bets vis-a-vis -vis the, the Quad and uh, all these things, you know. Uh, but since the Modi uh, regime, Modi government has come to power, Prime Minister Modi, we have seen uh, a more assertive uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, uh, compared to the, his predecessor, who was extremely cautious. I think Modi has uh, nurtured uh, the Quad and the other instruments, you know, Indo-Pacific, for example. Also, you know, Modi has signaled a more ambitious India on the world stage, willing to, uh, you know, push the envelope as it were. His famous speech in Shangri-La in right. Singapore, and I was there. It was uh, quite a, a speech uh, because it sent a very powerful vision. But at the same time, I was there in that hall in Singapore on that particular day. A lot of Western politicians, ministers and others, uh, well, they were a bit disappointed with that speech. Uh, the reason being, they were expecting India to be more uh, assertive, uh, aggressive vis-a-vis -vis China. But Modi spoke about inclusive Indo-Pacific. Right. That is not a limited club. So, you know, we were doing all this. Now, the difference is this, that the developments of the last few months have really provoked or compelled or left India with no choice but to pursue uh, other plurilateral, uh, trilateral, and formations like the Quad to, to build a kind of pressure group. You know, because you know what happened that as long as you were calculating that, uh, that India-China relations will move on an upward trajectory. There were issues like trade deficit, 
uh, issues which were more aspirational in nature, like energy, for example, but China did not support. But there were issues, the real issues was uh, on the trade balance, about preserving uh, uh, peace and stability in the on the boundary. I think Prime Minister Modi made it very clear so many times to the Chinese leader that look, at the end of the day, uh, maintaining peace and tranquility on the border is central to strength and solidity of India-China relations. And that, that informal, you know, two summits in Wuhan, that's very important to go back to that part. Wuhan, as well as Mamallapuram and Chennai, there was a hope that India-China relations will finally, you know, we are moving in the right direction. Of course, there were jitters beneath the surface. There were, there were undercurrents of tension and discordant notes and all that. But as the two large neighbors, and even now, I think, of course, now India will go a little more upfront with uh, the Quad as it has happened that they know that invitation to Australia will rile China uh, and all that. It will further create. But uh, basically, there is no other option. But in case, again, for example, India-China relations were to improve somewhat. So I think these two are, uh, you know, kind of linked that to what, how will you step up the Quad? Right. Uh, to the label of your bilateral relations and your threat perception or your friendship index, right. you know, how, how much you can accommodate each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way at all now to escape uh, the Chinese construct that you, you indeed have an Asian or Indo-Pacific NATO already in place? Uh, I mean, you know, this is a bit of an exaggerated uh, way of putting it. And Chinese are touchy. They have made it very clear they don't like this quad business. If you go to the editorials of the Global Times, which speaks for the government, Chinese establishment, in my personal conversations, uh, they they feel that it's a gang up. And if you strip it of its feel-good rhetoric and the politically correct, it's a kind of, you know, uh, not a gang up exactly, but yeah, coming together. That all four of us, four countries are coming together and saying that look, uh, we all have you know solid trade and everything with us. But listen, there is something called permissible and non-permissible in international behavior, right? And that's where you're going to be doing. Uh, so this uh, NATO, it is also trying to whip up that threat. You know, it is also trying to create a bogey. I think possibly uh, it's also a message aimed at. Uh, so there are two parts to it. One is that. By calling it, dubbing it as uh, Indo-Pacific NATO, it is registering the intensity of its dislike for the Quad. It's telling that, look, we don't like it. You know, and the, the second part is the messaging probably yeah. uh, to the domestic audience. That, look, China is victimized. China's rise is being resented, you know, right. and, and uh, Xi Jinping is a strong nationalist leader. So, you know, going forward, Meg, I personally feel that, uh, yes, it is all right to have this Quad. But to completely have that reductive approach to Quad and completely confuse it with uh, China containment, I think that needs to be tempered with. Because, uh, uh, you know, the positive aspects of quadrilateral cooperation now need to be stressed further and built on. So, for example, uh, from what I know, there are some very concrete ideas on the table beyond this uh, very ritualistic joint, uh, not, there is no joint statement, but by ritualistic reiteration of uh, a commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, there are some concrete ideas of practical cooperation on the table. So, for example, you have a notion, you have the concept of quad uh, supply, resilient supply chain initiative. Now, as you may know that India, uh, Japan and Australia have already forged some sort of framework. So the next logical step is to have a quadrilateral resilient supply. So then the quad does not become only the China. You need that supply. In some way, it is again directed about China domination of global uh, supply chains. But it's also about economic rejuvenation. It's also about playing a role in economic recovery. Each of these four countries have also been majorly affected economically. Uh, on the pandemic collaboration, there is huge scope. Uh, on quality infrastructure, again, the China may come in a subtext, uh, which is uh, to provide uh, an alternative, not necessarily a counter, to, to Belt and Road. People don't understand that you cannot really counter right. a project of that state. It has already moved ahead when you're just talking. When we're napping, the Chinese pushed ahead with the belt and road. So you cannot counter in any material sense of strategy. What you can do is 
you can uh, the four countries the four countries the liberal democracies free market democracies can provide an alternative paradigm and construct of connectivity so that's another practical area then you can uh, you know there is from india's point of view on uh, you know involving the quad which not many people have written about in development of the andam and nicobar islands you see we already have a uh, japanese participation in that we have also the uh, uh, involved with the united states there so why not have the australians in why not also make some of these things quad and not just militarization uh, which is that you know malabar so you know once you do all these things and you start right. delivering results then uh, quad will be seen as a grouping which stands for something much much beyond you know china containment right till that happen china will be justified in thinking that these guys are you know uh, acting uh, being clever by half and forging you know uh, a nato of indo pacific right right the last couple of questions one is is uh, with the changing politics in my country here in america uh, how do you look at a potential biden administration uh, visibly quad because the trump administration is all in with great amount of effusion and enthusiasm i seriously wonder whether a biden administration would be that or about that now that's a very relevant question and we are not far away from knowing the answer a uh, few weeks down the line but it will take longer but coming to that yeah the kind of uh, commitment or the kind of anti china platform which uh, trump built forth and and launched this all out trade war uh, with china i think uh, joe biden will have a a, a more restrained uh, uh, approach towards china a more nuanced approach towards china uh, you know the from what i uh, understand and gather that uh, you know the sentiment against china there is a critical uh, consensus in the united states across the board just as we say there is a robust bipartisan consensus for india there is a bipartisan consensus against china in some way you know uh, and that anti china because of the various things it has done and also it has acquired after trump uh, a, a strong nationalistic resonance as though to be you know to be resisting china uh, you know is part of being a nationalist uh, this thing so you know uh, i think biden uh, will uh, look for some sort of accommodation with china and to that extent of course he will be committed towards indo pacific on quality infrastructure a lot of those things there are also possibilities uh, say for example uh, biden is more committed to climate change and if we want to achieve his goals he needs to partner with china uh, like it or not american and chinese economy are still very intertwined you know Uh, all the posturing which he took to the extreme uh, from and all that uh, you know that has to be tam- tempered you know that has to be uh, sobered so i think under biden we don't know some of the things will continue like biden will not be it will not be a return ever to the clinton days when china and india were not even on uh, you know very prominently on the horizon uh, so so that will remain that uh, skepticism of china and all that but uh, some of this uh, hardline fanaticism that has crept in vis-a-vis china uh, in terms of you know hatred or antipathy and uh, whatever you call it that will be uh, nuanced but i think to the commitment to, of course you're right uh, if we compare he will not have the same commitment uh, probably or he will not have the same enthusiasm i think that's a more correct word commitment would mean that some ideal you're deviating from Uh, whereas uh, it is about yeah. his priority you know he because if he seeks accommodation with china uh, as the world's two largest economies have to some uh, sooner or later come to some sort of understanding you know some like in in our case uh, Jai, dr jay shankar says modus vivendi that india and china need to work out a modus vivendi and similarly america and china yeah. also going forward need to work out uh, some sort of understanding yeah and uh, finally to- Yeah. Finally, to narrow it down to a subject which personally interests me a great deal, uh, how do you see uh, 
Tibet as a factor playing now uh, within the India-China dynamic? Do you think Tibet has suddenly acquired a sharper edge or it is what it is, uh, what it was in 1950? Can you, can you just repeat that a bit? Uh, I didn't quite get it. Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah my, my point is uh, to narrow it down to, say, the subject of Tibet, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, right. With India-China dynamic being what it is after the dark, do you think Tibet as, a, as an issue might acquire a sharper edge than before, or you think it will be what it was in 1950 when China annexed it? Uh, you see... Um... Uh, in practical terms, I mean, you know, if you look at it, uh, we have accepted India-China policy, uh, sorry, one-China policy. Uh, in, that is India's uh, official position. Now, every time there is a conflict uh, or confrontation with China over some issue or the other, there are influential sections who try to whip up uh, this argument that, no, we've been extremely cautious with China, we are with China over Tibet, over uh, Taiwan, and other sovereignty points, you know, uh, that is mostly right. rhetoric. Like, for example, in this particular case, which has been by far the most serious crisis to have hit India-China relations in the past few decades, post-62, in a sense, uh, there has been uh, some very serious talk about uh, questioning uh, that one China policy about, uh, you know, leveraging Tibet. The, the ambiguous status of Tibet about, uh, uh, you know, recognizing Taiwan uh, and, and all that. But I think uh, this is like really going all out confrontation because you see, you must understand uh, that these are core sovereignty issues uh, for, for the Chinese government, for the CPC, for Xi Jinping. What it means, actually, people don't understand core sovereignty issue means only this, that these are the issues. If you uh, cross the red line, China will be justified in launching a war against that particular country. So if you do not, if you keep crossing this line, then you must be ready for an all-out confrontation. Uh, so unless we take this call, and this is something really, this is a really big picture view of what is happening, because uh, there are very, uh, you know, uh, hawkish voices right now in India who are saying that we should, you know, completely decouple from China. Uh, economic, some sort of economic steps we took uh, that kind of fueled this narrative. But that may be the larger strategic call. You see, because uh, given the position of China in the global system and the global economy, uh, I don't think any sensible uh, government can really uh, decouple, uh, either in the economic arena or in the foreign policy arena. In fact, uh, you know, as I was saying that for us, China being a neighbor, uh, that is a very important uh, factor in any formulation of a policy of vis-a-vis of, of, uh, -vis the region and the world. Because Americans sitting miles, thousands of miles away can afford to take very strident uh, hawkish posture. Uh, but India will always have to right. be more sensible. So, so there are calls, uh, which is that... Uh, that and, you know, and also this comes, this, this thing goes also back to China raking up uh, Kashmir in the UN, UN Security Council debates and all when we change the status of Jammu and Kashmir. So it is about now there is a strong section and I think that may be a slight change that unless China respects one India policy and you know completely you know takes uh, you know stays off Kashmir and other things we will also do things maybe not overtly but for example we can dramatically uh, increase our trade with Taiwan. We can start getting Taiwan into different right. formations and all that. So there are ways of doing it. But, you know, Mike, in this process, this conflict, if I mean, Chinese ambassador, I'm not speaking for him, talks about or anybody. And in, in fact, Jay Shankar also, Dr. Jay Shankar also talks about in the book, that thousand of years of history of India, China, uh, the phases of conflict are very, you know, very, uh, not even a few years. So like when we talk about contemporary, it's 1962 hmm. to 1970. So we have to take a long uh, view. Uh, you know, we also have to realize that we are located in the Asian hemisphere, uh, that there is something called the Asian century, which till the other day we were chasing. Sometimes we, uh, we also talk about Asian century with Japan, with China, with ASEAN. Uh, so I think there is really 
uh, uh, the idea is to move beyond immediate uh, uh, heat and dust and polemics and be serious because there are stakes involved. People's lives will be, I mean, imagine if you have an all out military conflict uh, between these two nuclear armed giant neighbors with, uh, you know, put together, they are now what, 17, 18 trillion dollar economy. It is going to be hugely, hugely disastrous. Uh, it's in nobody's interest. Uh, right. Both sides have to understand and work out uh, 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 mutual viability. Uh, so, so to do anything provocative uh, will only be tactical. So you may like finger like right, right now. We're talking about something, but it's not really uh, getting you anywhere. Okay. On that note, Manish, uh, I want to thank you for your time. This was for me. As always, uh, deeply informative. I'm sure it will be for our listeners and viewers too. Right, right. Okay, great, uh, man. Great talking to you. And uh, it's really a pleasure. This is an issue that will be discussed for many, many months now. So it is not the end of it, probably.